Good evening. How are you tonight? Again, may I have the privilege and the pleasure of coming into your home to visit with you for a little while. What would you like to talk about this evening on this anonymous telephone program? What subject is of concern to you? This is a program that is designed to cause a deeper interest, hopefully, in a most important book, and that book is the Bible. That is the Word of God. The Bible is the Word of God. Absolutely true and trustworthy, a book that we all want to become or should want to become more and more acquainted with. The Bible speaks to you, it speaks to me. It has some very serious things to say to you and me. And in the process of telling us these things, it also gives us an enormous amount of information concerning the beginning of the world, where it all came from, how it came into being, what the future of this world and its inhabitants are, and a whole lot of other things that cannot be found anywhere else. Information that can't be found anywhere else, but it is in the Bible. And we have the joy, we have the wonder, we have the pleasure of having time now to talk together about the Bible. This is a program to investigate the truths of in which we investigate the truths of the Bible seeking to have a better understanding seeking to know what is it that God is teaching us and how marvelous it is that God has allowed us to have this kind of a program night after night well this is your program we want to hear from you so shall we take our first call tonight please Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, good evening, Mr. Camping. Yes. Uh, yes. Um, would you turn to uh, Job chapter 41, please? Job 41. Let's take a look at that. Yes, in what verse? Uh, the, 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 the first verse, please. Job 41, verse 1. Canst thou draw out Leviathan with an hook, or his tongue with a cord? which thou lettest down, canst thou put a hook into his nose or bore his jaw through with a thorn, and so on. What is your question? Uh, well, when I look up the uh, Leviathan, when I look it up in the concordance, it, it talks about a symbol of Babylon and mourning, and Leviathan is a serpent. And I read through the entire chapter, and then when we get to the 34th verse, if you take a look at that, please. In verse 34, we read, he beholdeth all high things. He is king over all the children of pride. Is, is this entire chapter talking about uh, a Satan? Yes, it is really a chapter, I believe, that is speaking about Satan. That's proven by verse 34. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, indicating that he is a very strong foe. He is someone that has uh, got much... Uh, spiritual strength but of course we have to read about him in the light of the whole Bible right. and then we know that Christ has vanquished him right okay and one more quick question now you've done a lot of reading in the Hebrew and Greek what is that is there a book that I could get or you would recommend well, I would recommend that you get a Strong's or a Young's Concordance. Right. Because okay. that will give you all of the Hebrew uh, words for the nouns and verbs and adjectives and so on. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Camping. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Mr. Camping. Yes, hello to you. Hi. Um... I am a true believer. Um, God has really been making his presence um, known in my life. Um, I really want to read the Bible. Um, I really want to learn from it. Um, family radio is always on in my house. Well, the reason why I wanted to call you was because today I'm a stay-at-home mom. And today, two gentlemen came knocking at my door. And when I opened the door, I saw the name tag on one of the men. Um, they were from a church. And um, before I even let him speak, 
I said, we're believers in this house, and salvation can only come from God. And God is finished with the church. And um, he said, what do you mean God is finished with the church? And he was going to hand me something, but I closed the door. Um, my husband said that I didn't do the right thing, but I wanted to ask, um, because when I closed the door, I know that the Bible tells us in the book of John that not to even give these people, you know, to bid them Godspeed. So I, I feel like I did the right thing. I, I think you did the right thing. It, uh, it's, I can see where your husband could readily uh, misunderstand what you did, but but uh, you did what I would have done. I would have done the same thing. But okay, thank you. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, good evening, Brother Camping. Yes. I uh, would like you to go to Luke chapter 6. Luke 6. Starting in verse 1 through 5. Let's look at that. Luke 6. Verses 1 through 5. And it came to pass on the second Sabbath after the first that he went through the cornfields, and his disciples plucked the ears of corn and did eat, rubbing them in their hands. And certain of the Pharisees said unto them, Why do ye that which is not lawful to do on the Sabbaths, the Sabbath days? And Jesus answering them said, Have ye not read so much as this? What David did when himself was hungry, and they which were with him, how he went into the house of God, and did take and eat the showbread, and gave also to them that were with him, which it is not lawful to eat, but for the priests alone. And he said unto them, that the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. Okay, now can we go to Luke, Luke chapter 13, and verses 15 and 16. Luke 13, verses 15 and 16. Uh, there we read, uh, The Lord then answered him and said, Thou hypocrite, uh, thou uh, doth not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or his ass from the stall and lead him away to watering. And ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan hath bound below these eighteen years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day. Okay, now my question is, I've heard you say many times, on the Sabbath day we're not supposed to work. With, uh, the Sabbath day is supposed to be observed for the things of the Lord. But in some situations there are people that are required to work. And my point is that it, even unto Jesus, if Jesus worked on the Sabbath day. He didn't just uh, work Monday, at the, uh, the first six days, but he also worked on the Sabbath day. So in certain circumstances for certain individuals, we can't all say, well, you can't, you're not supposed to be working. I mean, what do we do with the firemen or well, a cop I, that protects our cities? Well, it's, it, I never did say that you can't do, there are certain things that cannot be done. For example, a, a farmer has cows to milk. He must milk them on Sunday uh, because otherwise his cows will will be harmed very greatly. He has to do that work of necessity. Uh, nurses and uh, have to work in hospitals to care for patients who are in there in in beds. Uh, 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 operations that are uh, are very uh, uh, necessary to take place very quickly have to, may have to be done. But any work that can be postponed till the next day should be postponed. But necessary work and and uh, uh, certain policemen have to work and so on. But uh, the uh, as much work as possible should not be done. Okay. I also just wanted to add one scripture. I know you had shared with someone uh, last week about um, you were reading in uh, Hebrews chapter seven about Melchizedek, and you were trying to remember what the scripture was in the Old Testament. It was Genesis chapter 14, verse 18. Yes. Which was, says, And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, yes. and was the priest of the Most High God. I just wanted to share that with also with you. Thank you for sharing it, and thank you for calling. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. 
Good evening, Brother Campany, and as always, it's just a sweet blessing to always be able to get in touch with you because it seems that you just always have the correct answers. Um, in uh, the book of uh, uh, Leviticus, towards the end of a few of the chapters, I'm not sure which uh, chapter it is, but it speaks of a woman having her sickness and uh, spreading the fountain of her blood, um, which is an aspect in my mind of uh, us as uh, us thinking of our mind of a woman having her monthly period. Yes. Um, what does that mean in the Well, you aspect? see, in the Old Testament, God set up a great many signs and types pointing to characteristics of, the, of uh, uh, what salvation is. For example, there were clean and unclean animals. The clean animals were a picture of those who were true believers. The unclean animals were a picture of those who uh, had not become saved. And clean and unclean uh, really shine through in a lot of the types. Uh, the same was true that if uh, someone touched a dead person, uh, they were unclean, ceremonially unclean, and they could not come into the temple. A woman who had a discharge from her body was ceremonially unclean, and she could not come into the temple as long as she had that discharge. And uh, that's why, for example, remember in the New Testament, there was the woman who had an issue of blood for 12 years, right? and she touched Jesus' garment. He now, felt it. And, and that was a terrible thing that she did because she was ceremonially unclean. And when she touched, uh, because she was a ceremonially unclean person and she touched Jesus' garment, then he became unclean. And, and uh, it was a very audacious thing to do. But actually, it was a dramatic picture of salvation because before we're saved, we're spiritually unclean, just like the woman with the issue of the blood. And we have to touch Jesus. That is, he has to take upon himself our uncleanness, our sins that make us unclean. And he has to pay the penalty for them because... Uh, when he took upon himself our sins, he came under the wrath of God, and so he has to bear the wrath of God as, as payment for those sins, and so we become cleansed of our sins, just like the woman with the issue of blood became, uh, became healed because she had touched the garment of Jesus. Well, you know, I always... Uh in prayer, you know, I always ask the Lord to uh, but you continue see to that, bless you. Yeah, see that that business of being ceremonially unclean does not apply today. Uh, today, right, exactly. if you have a discharge, uh, God doesn't use that figure anymore. Uh, once Christ went to the cross, those ceremonial laws we read about them, but we don't observe them any longer. It's it's spiritual. It's just totally spiritual. And um, I'm, I'm I'm so glad that Lord the Lord had a, thank, thank and bless you. you. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hi. Hi. I have a question. Yes. I know that we're supposed to um. The Bible it does not agree in homosexuality, does it? The Bible does not which. Does not agree on homosexuality. Does not agree on what kind of authority? Homosexuality. Oh, on homosexuality. Yes. Oh, the Bible absolutely agrees on homosexuality. That is, it is agrees that homosexuality is a very grievous sin. Uh, that right. it, it does not condone homosexuality in any sense whatsoever. So. If someone is gay, the Bible doesn't have a problem with it? Oh, on the contrary, if, uh, you know, the Bible lists, if you go, for example, to 
uh, to uh, Romans chapter 1. God lists about 20 or 25 sins there, gross sins. And amongst the first one named, as a matter of fact, is homosexuality. Mm-hmm. And, and if we're guilty of any sin, we're under the wrath of God. That's why we desperately need a Savior. Now, wonderfully, whether we are uh, a murderer or if we're living in adultery or living as a homosexual, homosexual or living as a thief or whatever, whatever our sins may be, if Christ becomes our Savior, then all of those sins have been paid for. And as a matter of fact, we never want to be a thief any longer or a homosexual or a, an adulterer or a murderer any longer. So as Christians, how are we supposed to help these people? Well, we, they're, they're, they're no different than all the people of the world who are not saved. We are to, to pray for their salvation. We are to try to present the gospel to them that we're all sinners by nature and we desperately need Christ to pay for our sins. Uh, the homosexual needs that just as badly as anyone needs it. Okay. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Mr. Camping. Yeah. My question this evening is in regards to your theory on Christ returning in the year 2011. Uh, before I get to my question this evening, I'd like for you to read for myself and for the other listeners Mark chapter 13, verses 32 and 33. Mark 13, verses 32 and 33. Let's read that. 32. But of that day and that hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. Take ye heed, watch and pray, for ye know not when the time is. And my question regarding that is, last evening on your program you mentioned uh, to a particular caller to uh, try to find reference in the Bible regarding what year Christ will be returning. Now, keeping the two verses that you just read in mind, how can one possibly, if you cannot know the day or the hour, how can you possibly make an assumption based on those verses that Christ will indeed be returning in 2011? Well, because we read the Bible very carefully, and the Bible... Uh, uh, uses language very carefully. He, God did, he said no man can know the day or the hour, and I don't contend with that at all. I have no idea what day it is or what hour it is. But on the other hand, God gave a lot of information that uh, we have to look at. He gave a lot of information concerning the timing of the flood of Noah's day, which was a picture of... Uh, of uh, this final day of judgment. He gave uh, the, ex- the exact day uh, when uh, Nineveh was going to be destroyed during the days of Jonah. He just tells us, for example, in First Thessalonians 5, that that day will uh, come as a thief for those who are not ready. But on the other hand, uh, that day will not surprise you as a thief. Uh, in other words, there's a whole lot of information that has to be harmonized and factored in. We can't, we can't look at that those two verses and say, oh, well, now no one can know that uh, anything about the time. Uh, uh, it specifically emphasizes no man can know the day or the hour. And uh, and but uh, we have to look at we have to look at everything in the Bible, and then we find that uh, we can know quite a quite, quite a bit about uh, the timing of the end. Like, for example, why would God tell us in Mark 13 that <clears throat> when you see the fig tree and leaf, then you know that Christ is at the very gates and uh, at the very door and, uh, and so on. Now, wh- how y- y- we have to take into account every- everything. And 
And that's what I've tried to do when I come up with the fact that it's possible that the year 2011 could be the year of Christ's return. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Camping. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Mr. Camping. Um, I have two questions. First of all, in Noah's time, do you know approximately how many people there were on Earth then? I, I, the, the only thing, uh, one time I did this, I, uh, as I read the Bible, I find that Noah only had three sons. I find that later on, uh, Tira, uh, who lived to be 205 or 215, I guess 205 years, that he had uh, three or four sons. In other words, I, as I read the Bible uh, about those whose children are named, I find that even though people lived to be 900 years of age, as did uh, uh, did Noah, he came, he lived to be 950 years of age. Nevertheless, ordinarily their families did not appear, I'm using that language very carefully, that word very carefully, did not appear to be any larger than our families. And then given the fact that uh, a, a uh, family would, would uh, uh, last for hundreds of years, uh, I kind of worked through that and I thought, well, that may, may show that maybe by the time of the flood, there were a million people, or maybe two million people, some number of that size. Now, I could be a long, long ways away, and it's not really important to know that number, but I, my guess is that it was something along that order. I was just wondering uh, that there was nobody that, that uh, you know, praised God or anything, that it was just Noah and his family and nobody else. Well, prior to Noah, to the time of the flood, there were those. There was Enoch, for example, who was a believer. And there was a line of believers that came down to Noah. But when finally the flood came, uh, we do know there were only eight people, Noah and his wife, his three sons and their respective wives, who did uh, have a relationship with God. And and uh, so it was a very, very tiny number, a very tiny remnant. Of course, we must remember that throughout the Old Testament era, God had not developed the plan to evangelize the whole world. That, had, that did not go into, into pra practice until Christ returned to heaven 2,000 years ago. So the, it was not God's intention to save uh, very many people throughout the Old Testament era. Once Christ went back to heaven, then he gave the command to every true believer and commissioned them uh, and ordained them as a true prophet to bring the gospel to the world. And so ever since Christ went back to heaven, the percentage of believers in the world would have been somewhat increased over what was true in the Old Testament days. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Mr. Cammy. Yes. Matthew chapter 7, verses 15 through 17, please. Matthew chapter 7, verse 15. Let's look at that. Matthew... Seven, verse 15 and we read beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing but inwardly they are ravening wolves you shall know them by their fruits do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles even so every good tree bringeth forth good fruit but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit a good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. Now, what is your question? 
Well, you're going to have to physically squelch my voice again, otherwise truth will go forth and there will be no remedy. Now let us compare the fruits of the local congregations with the fruits of family radio. The local congregations are feeding people. They are clothing people. They are visiting the sick. They are changing lives. They're taking drug addicts out of their drug habits. They're taking prostitutes away from their terrible profession. They're doing all kinds of wonderful, positive things in the world. Now tell us, what is your organization doing? Well, the, the, uh, we have to define fruit. We have to start with the Bible, not what we think is fruit, but what does the Bible say is fruit. Now, if we go to Galatians chapter 5, Galatians chapter 5, there we read in uh, verse 22, uh, uh, we read the fruit of the Spirit, and remember, a child of God, uh, someone who is a true believer, is going to be indwelt by the Holy Spirit. So this has to do with the true believers. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperaments, temperance, against such there is no law. All right, now let's start out with this. just this first uh, attribute uh, that there are this first fruit love what is God's definition of love now you'll notice that uh, as I give what you're going to call later on a, oh, a long 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 answer well that's what happens when we have to uh, prove our point from the Bible and we always want to prove from the scriptures we don't want to prove just because we think this or think that now in Luke 14 God defines love he says in verse 21, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father. All right, so the fruit of the Spirit is love, and love is to obey the commandments of God. Now, the commandment of God to the true believers is go into all the world with the gospel. And that's what we are doing in family radio. We, uh, we, uh, the, the, the command of the Bible is love your neighbor as yourself. And the love that we have for ourselves is salvation. That's the highest good, so we want it for our neighbor. Hold on, I'll be right back with this after this call. When we look at the world very objectively, uh, we... Uh, if we're going to see the whole story, we're going to see two things. On the one hand, we see a world that has many, many physical needs because of man's inhumanity to man or because of hurricanes or earthquakes or tsunamis or, or uh, famines, whatever may come. We see a lot of physical needs. But on the other hand, if we're a true child of God, we see a need that is infinitely more terrible and desperate than any of these physical needs. In a few years, everyone in the world who is not saved is going to be standing at the judgment throne of God and individually are going to have to stand there and answer to God for their life. And if they have not become a child of God, they, uh, and they will not have been because that's why they are standing there at the judgment throne, they will be found guilty, sentence will be passed, the day of mercy is gone, and they will end up forever in hell under the wrath of God. And there isn't anything, any physical trial or difficulty in the world that even begins to touch on the enormous terribleness and, and uh, terror that goes along with eternal damnation. And the only remedy is to hear, uh, to be able to hear the gospel because it is through the gospel, the hearing of the gospel that God saves and, and those whom he plans to save so that they will not be standing there for judgment. So now we understand that. Now, we ne therefore have to make a decision. How are we going to make our lives as efficient 
as possible for on behalf of the world. We know there are lots of people that understand the physical needs but have no understanding at all of this terrible, terrible, terrible terror that is awaiting the human race. But we know about that. And so we're going to use all of our efforts in order to warn the world and in order to get the gospel out there so that there can be some more that will become saved. That is uh, the enormous uh, task that Family Radio sees for it to do. And so I appreciate it that if you don't understand hell or you don't want to face the reality of hell, yes, then you don't understand Family Radio. You think that we are are uh, uh, don't care about people my ex it's exactly the opposite we ter we care tremendously about people we we want in our love for them we want the highest good for them namely salvation but thank you for calling and sharing and shall we take our next call please good evening welcome to open forum Hello, Brother Campton. How are you this evening? Very well, thank you. Uh, two, two quick questions. One, I need to know, and I was, I'm was i a Catholic Christian, and is there such thing they've been saying, not eating meat on certain days of the year? There's nothing in the Bible that relates to that. You can eat meat every single day of the year and not be in disagreement with anything in the Bible. Moreover, that can be any kind of meat that you want to eat, uh, there is no such a thing as clean or unclean meat. Oh, so you can eat it any time because I know the Catholic is um, what they do is they have it where it's I have a little problem understanding. But okay, definitely we can eat meat uh, regardless if they say it's Holy Friday and this and that. Yes. Uh, so well. that's good. Okay. Uh, n my next question, real quick, is when people say saints, they believe in a lot of saints. Um, I'm just starting to learn to, to study and read and understand. I'm a little confused of a lot of things as I'm reading, and I do have your book, um, Breach and Tears, and the End of the Church Age. So um, I was just wondering to find out. Um, well, we'll see what, what has happened is that each denomination, each church has formulated certain rules that they want their constituents, their members to follow and the Roman Catholic Church has quite a few rules concerning the eating of meat and marriage and and so on and so on and so on and uh, and uh, uh, most of those rules do not come from the Bible at all they are simply formulated by the clergy by the uh, uh, those who are spiritually in charge of, of that uh, denomination and they want their constituents to follow those but but they have nothing to do with the bible they only have to do with that kind of a gospel uh, if we're going to have the truth we only want to listen to the bible the bible alone and in its entirety but thank right, you one more yes um it's the, the i'm hella confusing of the sabbath if, if the people follow the sabbath i understand so far would be on a saturday well, but what, which see, is it now? Well, the the problem is is that the the uh, many uh, there are people who do not realize that there was a change in uh, that that the seven. Or let me start again. That the seventh day Sabbath of the Old Testament that is written about very extensively in the Bible was a ceremonial law. It was just like the laws concerning clean and unclean meat or laws concerning burnt offerings or blood sacrifices or, or special feast days and so on. And all of that was completed in Christ. We don't observe those laws any longer. But God did institute a not a ceremonial law but a moral law that on Sunday is the Sabbath. It is called the Day of the Lord, the Lord's Day. And on that day, God wants us to focus our attention altogether on the Lord, 
uh, share the gospel with others, uh, study the word of God, have it a time when we are not under no obligation to care to uh, to try to make a living and do all the other things that we do during the other six days. And that's why most churches from the very uh, beginning of the church age, which began right after Christ went to heaven, have done it correctly, and uh, that is they observe Sunday as the Sabbath, not the Saturday. But it is true, there are... Uh, uh, there is at least one gospel, the Seventh-day Adventist gospel, that is very vociferous. They have, uh, they are very aggressive in their teaching and claiming that they have the truth and that we are to worship on the seventh day. But they have a different kind of a gospel altogether. And so we don't want to follow what they're teaching at all. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Mr. Camping. Yes. I was your last caller of the last evening, but I didn't get to finish asking you my question, and I'm almost afraid to ask it. But um, over the last several years, I have made it a practice to try to read the four Gospels relating to what people relate to as Holy Week. And I found that the harmony of the gospel in the back of the Bible that I use is not, doesn't appear to be totally accurate with the gospels. But the one thing that really impressed me this year, and it um, happened especially when I got to Luke about um, what we also call the Last Supper um, in Luke 22 beginning, um, I guess, especially at verse 15. Um, I don't know if you've ever gotten this impression that Jesus was present with his disciples at this meal, but that he did not partake himself of any food or drink. Well... I, it, that is not uh, that that may be so. I, the Bible is is not really clear about that at all. He did say, and he took the bread, and or or he did say in verse 18, for I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took bread and gave thanks and brake it and gave unto them, saying, This is my body which is given to you. This do in remembrance of me. And you are correct. I don't think there's any statement here that he himself partook. Now, uh, whether that's important or not, I don't know. I've never thought about that. Okay. Yeah, I was just wondering because um, it... But you After see, all the times of reading it, it's the first time that that has occurred to me. Yes. Well, I, I, I the Bible... It does not disclose that he did partake, uh-huh. nor does it disclose that he did not partake. In other words, the Bible is silent on the issue, and and I'm not sure that it's important. Maybe it is, but I've never thought about it, so I'm not qualified to speak to it. Okay, well, I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, good evening. Um, does the Bible declare that swine is an unclean meat to eat? Does the Bible declare which? Swine, the pig. Oh, is it unclean to eat? Yes, we can eat any kind of meat. You know, we read in in the Old Testament, uh, a pig was unclean, just like shark was unclean or catfish was unclean or horse meat was unclean. But in the New Testament... God uh, uh, indicates that all meats are clean. We read in in uh, 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 First Timothy chapter four, verse four: For every creature of God is good, and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. Uh, and that uh, accords with what happened in the book of Acts when Peter was ready to 
uh, to uh, God was training him, preparing him to bring the gospel to a cursed heathen dog, a Gentile named Cornelius, and and of course Peter had been schooled in the in the Old Testament and and uh, would never, never, never have entered into a Gentile's home. But God, in order to prepare him for that, let down a sheet from heaven on which there were all kinds of unclean meats, and he commanded Peter, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter was offended, not so, Lord. And then Lord, the Lord says, What I have cleansed, you eat. And it, it was he was demonstrating to Peter, you know, these laws concerning uh, unclean meats uh, don't apply anymore. And now it is uh, my plan that you true believers are to minister to these heathen dogs, uh, the Gentiles, just as you minister to the Jewish people. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Brother Campbell. Yes. Yeah, well, let me turn my radio down. Uh, yes, you had a caller that uh, he calls quite often. He uh, argues with you all the time about the end of the church age. And you always lead him to uh, Revelations uh, 22, 18 and 19. And he said that only uh, applies to the books of Revelation. And I was wondering if he has a pen or paper, uh, he can look up Deuteronomy 4.2, where it says, You shall not add or take away from my word. Proverbs 30, verse 6 says, Don't add to my words. And would you look up um, Deuteronomy 13, verse 5 to 1, that talks about uh, prophets and dreamers. And I was wondering, does that apply to the church of our days? Well, it surely does. You know okay. that God says in Deuteronomy 13, if there was a dreamer who comes to you, with a sign or a wonder, and that sign or wonder does come to pass, but he's asking you to go after other gods. Now, that is the, that's the key to that, those verses there. Okay. To go after other gods means that you are listening to something that, that you're claiming is from God when it has not come from God. Now, the, the weakness of, De of quoting from Deuteronomy 4 it is true, it says virtually the same thing as Revelation 22. The problem is, it doesn't mention the word book. Uh, oh. It just says, don't add to the word of God. Right. But, okay. uh, but in Revelation 22, it says, uh, don't add uh, anyone who adds to the words of the prophecy of this book. And we know that the, the book of Revelation is an integral part of the Bible. If we add a verse... Uh, to the book of Revelation, we have added it to the Bible. If we take away a verse from the book of Revelation, we've taken it away from the Bible. In other words, the book of Revelation is an integral part of the whole Bible, so that ultimately the book that is mentioned in Revelation 22 has to be the whole Bible. Yeah, I agree with that. And uh, one, uh, a question, too. Uh, there's a TV ministry that most churches teach that um, after the rapture, that's when the, the tribulation appears for seven years. And, I, and I'm sure a lot of people in the audience that's listening would like to know, too, is how did they come up with that interpretation? Because uh, you're, you're, uh, uh, when you read the Bible, yours makes more sense that the tribulation or the rapture falls immediately after the tribulation. But the churches and most of your TV ministries, like Jack Van Empey, uh, preaches that uh, that the rapture will take place first and then the seven-year tribulation. And I'm just wondering, how did they come up with that interpretation? Well, you must, that, that interpretation came up, oh, many, many decades ago. I can't pinpoint it, maybe a hundred years ago. It was a so-called uh, pre-millennial position that it really gained the ascendancy. And it was at a time when there were God-fearing ministers, ministers whom I, whom I truly believe were ch children of God, who were trying to understand many of the prophetic passages, and, but it was not time for them to understand. God had not uh, taken the wraps off of a lot of the uh, information concerning the end of the world, and so they did their best 
and came up with the so-called premillennial view that that uh, where the rapture would occur either before a seven-year tribulation period or in the middle of it or at the end of it and and then would follow a thousand-year reign of Christ on earth here on the other hand there were those who came up with a post-millennial position uh, that uh, and equally it was flawed in that they said oh yes there uh, 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 after the tribulation there would be a thousand years but not because Christ has come back to reign in from Jerusalem but because the world would gradually through the gospel become more and more under the authority of the gospel then uh, there were the amillennialists uh, who believed no there both the post-millennial and the pre-millennial position are not accurate but that the world is going to go right on to the end and then right at the end Christ is going to return and then will be the rapture now all three uh, of these systems had some flaws in them in our day we God has uh, it's the time when God is opening our eyes to a whole lot more information it isn't because we're smarter or wiser than the, the theologians of another day but it's simply that we're living in a time when when God is revealing these things and now we know absolutely without any question the rapture is the last day by my the Bible says it so plainly in John 6 in verse uh, 39 and in verse 40 and verse 44 and verse 54 four times mm -hmm. and I will raise him up the last day and then in John 12 verse 48 God uh, indicates that that's judgment <coughs> day where he says and this word will judge them in the last day and and uh, so on and uh, there's a lot of other evidence that clearly indicates the rapture is the last day and uh, there's nothing more that follows insofar as this present universe is concerned it will be burned with fire and be recreated new heavens and a new earth and so uh, why these men still cling to these ideas that were formed uh, a hundred years or so ago and and is I think the problem is they are reading their theological books and not the Bible they they uh, they are not going uh, checking out and checking out uh, verse by verse what they had been taught in their theological books against the Bible but they're clinging to those theological books the the theologians of the past because they highly regard them and they believe that they had the truth and therefore they can't do better than they had done but frankly uh, God has given us the Word of God to study and study and study and then we really come to truth thank you for calling and sharing and shall we take our next call please good evening welcome to open forum yes mr. camping I have a couple questions tonight um, I was wondering why in the Bible does it only speak of Jesus birth and then the crucifixion why does it leave out some of his life we must remember that Christ came to be the Savior now uh, obviously the one big out one big outstanding event is that he took on a human nature so there's quite a bit of information about his birth uh, where uh, we do find a couple of phrases that he, for example he lived in Nazareth and was a carpenter under his uh, stepfather's uh, uh, tutelage and we know that he was subject to Mary and Joseph uh, that uh, that is an, an insight we do find one little uh, incident when he was 12 years of age he was in uh, in Jerusalem on the Passover and he was there we get the insight that he knew that he was the Messiah must I not be about my father's business and so God gave us that gave us that little insight then the next big thing is when officially he began 
his work as the Messiah. Uh, in other words, uh, growing up in Nazareth, his work had not yet begun. He was simply uh, waiting for the time when he, in A.D. 29, uh, and John the Baptist uh, uh, baptized him and, and announced that he was the Lamb of God that would take away the sin of the world, uh, that officially began his work as the Messiah. And then we have a lot of detail. From that point on, we have a lot of detail for the th during uh, uh, describing the three and a half years that he was preaching and preparing to go to the cross. We have a great amount of detail concerning the cross. We have the detail of him ascending back to heaven. And uh, there it is. In other words, the important issues are spread out on the Bible. The unimportant issues, God does not speak to us about them except to maybe handle it in one sentence. Okay, but why doesn't it speak about his younger life, just his older life? Because in his younger life, he was not officially doing the work of the Savior. He had not been, uh, he officially had not begun his work. He was preparing for it, but it was uh, that is, he had to wait for the, the right time, in the fullness of time. There was a, God had a timetable for these things, but his work had not begun yet. He, he was, uh, all we know about was that he was subject to his parents, and he, uh, and he worked as a carpenter. That's all we know about it. Okay, now I, I've heard from someone that there's four books that were left out of the Bible, is that the Apocrypha Burks? There are no, there is nothing left out of the Bible. Are those there, you have Bible critics who come up with all kinds of audacious and and crazy ideas and uh, and flamboyant ideas. Uh, they their imagination works over time, and they and they always want to have something a little different, something exciting to talk about, and uh, and so they. Uh, they they developed this idea or that idea and and uh, but the fact is the Bible is God's book and we know that it is that everything that God wanted us to have in that book is there we don't have to worry about something being left out. Okay, just one more question: Why did Jesus speak in parables? Well, the Bible explains that. That's a very good question. In Mark chapter, and, and Matthew he explains this, but let me read from the Gospel of Mark. We read in, uh, in Mark chapter, uh, uh, chapter 3, let me see, uh, in Mark chapter 4, uh, he, he said uh, in verse 11, Unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, but unto them that are without, all these things are done in parables, that seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand, lest at any time they should be converted and their sin should be forgiven them. And in other words, God spoke in parables so that those who did not trust the Bible and whom God had not planned to save either that they would remain in in uh, in ignorance of the real truths of the Bible uh, it, and that's why God wrote the Bible so that it's so difficult to understand it is there are so many uh, verses that we, that even the true believers have to puzzle over and puzzle over and pray the Lord for wisdom and and uh, maybe then we don't understand. God wrote the Bible, so we have to search it out and and uh, under the f fundamental premise that it is the Word of God. It is absolutely true, even though I do not understand it. And anyone who doesn't go to the Bible that way. They're going to be blinded. They're not going to even begin to, to get a uh, close to a real understanding of the salvation message of the Bible. Thank you very much. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our 
The next call, please. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Brother Kevin? Yes. How are you this evening? Very well, thank you. Yes, I had um, three questions. My first question is, um, for the believers who are saved, when they go to heaven, um, will there be a specific... Does the Bible say anything about what will we do as a, a duty in... The only clue that we have of what the believers will do when we go to heaven is in one of the parables, Christ said to one, I will make you a ruler over five cities. To another, I will make you a ruler over two cities. Secondly, we do find that we uh, will be reigning with Christ. So it, uh, but th that's all we have. We have no other information. And we, anything more, I would say, would be pure speculation. Hold on, I'll be right back with you right after this message. We're continuing with the Open Forum program. We have a, still have a caller on the line. Go ahead. Yes, uh, my second question is that I heard you said for the unbelievers, when they're not saved and they're dead, they go to a place of silence, correct? Yes. Yeah, so if they go to a place of silence, are they by themselves? Does the Bible talk about anything about going to a silent place after death if they're unsaved? Well, the Bible, the only verse that really helps us is that is Psalm 115. Let me turn to that a moment. I think it's where we read that in Psalm 100. And 15, where we read um, in verse uh, 17, the dead praise not the Lord, neither any that go down into silence. Now that verse has a lot more to say than just what happens when we die, but, but included in this, I think it is the fact, first of all, we know that that whether you're a believer or not a believer, your bodies go down to a place of silence. They, and our bodies, even after we are saved, are still spiritually dead. Uh, and, and because they're spiritually dead, when we die physically, we cannot go into heaven. And so our bodies go in, into the grave. Uh, uh, in our soul existence, in the case of the true believer, we've received a brand new resurrected soul in which we have eternal life, and therefore we can't go to, into a place of silence. We, we uh, uh, change residency and immediately are in the presence of God in heaven where we live until Christ brings us with him on the last day. But now in the case of the unsaved, their bodies go into the grave also and return to the dust. What about their souls, their spirit essence? They can't go into heaven. They can't be put in hell because hell uh, is, uh, is not a place yet. It, it has, it, uh, God, first of all, has to, they first of all have to be judged at the judgment throne and be found guilty. And so where are they? They, uh, this uh, verse fits. They go down. They, they're in their souls. They're spiritually dead, and they end up in a place of silence. They, in other words, I think we could look at it this way: that when a the average person dies who is not saved, the next thing that he knows consciously is that he is standing at the judgment throne of God on the last day. It's like he has been in a long sleep from the time he died until the end of the world. And remember, people have been dying for the last 13,000 years. And then uh, they are, are uh, resurrected, as we read in Revelation, excuse me, John, um, uh, John chapter 5, verse 28 and 29. The hour cometh when all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth, some to the resurrection of judgment and some to the resurrection of life. And so uh, they're, uh, at that time, they're going to come forth as a whole personality out of the grave, out of the place of silence, wherever their soul has been, and, uh, and be standing as a live person, physically alive, uh, waiting their turn for it to be judged. Thank Hello? you. 
Yes. My last question is, um, you said um, it's not true when you think that somebody, when you dream about something, you think it's Jesus, and it's not because Jesus only comes through the Word of God, which is the Bible. So does, my question is, um, do dreams have any significance overall? Well, they can. In other words, I have found in my life, for example, if I have a nightmare and uh, that has happened in the past, I ask myself, what am I afraid of? It helps me to analyze my, my uh, th thinking when I'm conscious. Because, you see, uh, I think what happens in dreams is that our subconscious mind is trying to uh, work out some of the problems it was not able to work out while we were conscious but but uh, uh, that nightmare uh, means that I, I'm fearful of something is it an individual is it if I'm afraid of hell am I I'm, I'm fearful of something I've had experience for example where I have committed sin in my dream and uh, and then I knew that uh, that particular sin, which I knew, was not really that consciously aware of being interested in, uh, actually, uh, perhaps I was a lot more interested in that than I thought, and it uh, it was actually a part of my personality more than it ought to be, and so it was a warning to me: uh, look, be careful that you don't don't uh, entice yourself in any uh, way toward this kind of a sin, and. So our dreams can 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 uh, at least help a little bit in helping us to understand ourselves, but they are not messages from God. They are the only message from God is the Bible. Good evening, welcome. Let's take our next call and thank you for calling. Good evening, welcome to Open Forum. Yeah, Brother Candy. Yes. I'd like to uh, offer another verse I think probably further supports the, the doctrine that the uh, rapture's in the last day. Yes. And also, I think it ties in really well with the, the verses you just quoted from John chapter 5, verse, verses 28 and 29. Uh, yeah, the scripture is from Matthew chapter 13, verses 47 through 50. Let's look at that. Matthew 13, verse 47. There we read, and the kingdom of heaven is like unto a net that was cast into the sea and gathered of every kind, which, when it was full, they drew to shore and sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but cast the bad away. So shall it be at the end of the world, the angel shall come forth and sever, that is, separate, the wicked from among the just and shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be weeping, wailing, and gnashing of teeth. Yes, there. in fact, that separation is going on already because the judging process has already begun. Judgment began with the house of God, it's, that is the local congregations, and already there is separation going on, and it will be, reach its final state when Christ appears and all the true believers are caught up to be with him, they're separated from all the unsaved. The unsaved will be standing here to await their turn to be judged. Yeah, Brother Campy. Yes. You know in Exodus chapter 4, verse 11, uh, could you read that? Exodus chapter 4. Exodus. Chapter 4, verse 11. Let's look at that. There we read, And the Lord said unto him, and this is at a time when Moses was complaining to the Lord. The Lord had said, I want you to bring uh, the children of Israel out of Egypt and uh, on their way to the land of Canaan. And, and Moses was objecting, I, I've got, I am a poor of speech. And the Lord said unto him, Who hath made man's mouth? Or who maketh the dumb, or deaf, or the seeing, or the blind? Have not I the Lord? In other words, God takes full responsibility and accountability for the fact that babies are born 
uh, with defective limbs and uh, and uh, uh, so on. Uh, this is all part of the fact that God's curse has come upon this world. Right. Well, you know, what confuses me is, uh, and, and I don't have the verse to to, to uh, compare it to right now, but somewhere in the New Testament, Christ said, I think it was on the on the Sabbath, he said uh, to the Pharisees, he said, uh, should I not heal this man that Satan has bound up for these 18 years or something to that effect? Well, Here he's saying that in, in this verse, you see what I'm saying? He's saying Satan has bound him up. But in Exodus 4, verse 11, Christ is saying, he's saying, haven't I, isn't I the one who created the blind? And the, well, see what I'm saying? See, there are some people who ascribe illness and so on to and uh, affliction of these kinds to Satan, and they'll use that kind of a verse to do that. But the fact is... Uh, it is God who has done it because he brought this world under the curse, uh, under his curse, because mankind who ruled over this world had come under the curse. This is what we read about in Romans 8, where it says there that the whole creation became subject to vanity or futility uh, uh, and awaits the uh, revealing of the sons of glory, that is, awaits the time when this curse will be removed. and. And because the curse is here, we have thorns and thistles and viruses and and uh, uh, defective genes and all the other things that bring about these things. God takes full accountability, but the but the reason for it is not because of Satan; it's because of man sin. Man has rebelled against God, uh, and and uh, therefore. Uh, he, he, uh, he, uh, God has brought the whole creation under God's curse. We find this the same. Uh, the same thing is true in animals. We find the same thing is true in the ground itself, as we have earthquakes and volcanoes and other things that are very destructive. And uh, Satan is not the one who bring the, brings these things about. Now it is true that when God says that Satan has bound this individual for 18 years. Uh, that uh, that uh, God there is using physical deformity as a or a, a physical uh, binding of some kind. We don't exactly know what it was uh, as a picture of the fact that Satan is uh, is a cruel taskmaster uh, for all those who are not saved. But even as Christ was able to heal that person, that picture of of making someone saved, or bringing someone to salvation, uh, be, uh, so God can do bring about salvation to anyone. Satan is not the victor; Christ is. But thank you okay, for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, Brother Camping. How are you? Very well, thank you. Uh, I have two points, uh, one point and one question. Um, the first one is a woman called earlier, and she was uh, talking about how Jesus and Luke abstained from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom comes. Yes. And uh, I read a passage in the Gospel of John nineteen twenty-eight through 30. John 19... 28 through 30. Oh, no, she was, her point was that at the Lord's Supper he was not eating. Yes, over. but then uh, Jesus says immediately following that he would not uh, um, drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom comes. Let's look, let's read John 19 and what verse? 28 through 30. 28 to 30. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar and put it upon hyssop and put it to his mouth. Uh, when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. Now, she was not speaking of this. She was speaking okay. of the fact that at the Lord's Supper, mm -hmm. when uh, the apostles were receiving the bread and the uh, uh, the uh, other, the, whatever that was offered there at the... Uh, at the uh, that was a final Passover night as well as an introduction to the Lord's Supper 
uh, Jesus himself did not partake. And I, as, we indi as I indicated, the Bible is silent about this. Yeah, this, this vinegar that he's partaking is a picture of the fact that he's drinking the dregs of the wrath, of the cup of the wrath of God. Oh, I thought what it meant here was that when he did take this vinegar, that is when the kingdom began. Oh, no, it has okay. nothing to do with that. It has to do with this, uh, uh, the fact that he is, uh, is drinking the wrath of God, this, uh, the cup of the wrath of God. Okay. Well, the question that I had was um, 1 John 5, verse 7. 1 John chapter 5, verse 7, where yes. that beautiful passage where God, uh, Christ is speaking, uh, or God is speaking about the fact that, uh, that there are th three persons in the Godhead. This is a passage that we can't understand. We just accept it because it is the Word of God. But he says in verse 7, For there are three that bear a record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and from John 1 we know the Word is the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And we, uh, there are those who try to uh, explain this, and frankly, you can't explain it. Uh, uh, if you take into account everything the Bible teaches, there's no way to explain it. Uh, we have to walk very humbly recognizing that our little finite human minds are, are, were not designed by God to be able to understand an infinite God such as God is. Well, the question that I had was, I agree with the Trinity, but I, discussing it with Jehovah Witnesses, they tell me that this verse isn't found in some of the manuscripts. Is that true? That is absolutely not true true okay. that is incidentally something that uh, uh, many of the later translations uh, want to indicate and that's because it was taken out uh, in one of the Catholic or one of the uh, Latin versions and uh, then translations were made from the Latin version and it did not appear there oh, but if we go all the way back to the uh, 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 manuscripts that are available prior to any of them being translated into the Latin language, uh, that is, go back to the second century, we find very definitely these verses are there. Oh, wonderful. Well, you have a good evening. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, good evening, Brother Chapping. How are you doing? Very well, thank you. Uh, I have a question. It's uh, the book of Hebrews. Um, I don't know the exact verse. I think it's Hebrews. Yeah, could you turn your radio off, please? We're getting a lot of feedback. Yes, I turned it off. It's, right. um, in Hebrews chapter 10, I believe it's verse 13 or 14 where it says, talks about gathering ourselves together. And, uh, and, and and so much the more as we see that day approaching. Verse you know, 25, th verse 25. Okay. My question is, at the end of that verse where it says, until you see that day, what, what does it mean uh, by that day? What, what, Ordinarily, what is that? like in this verse, as you see the day approaching, it is speaking about judgment day. That is, it's speaking about the end of the world when Christ returns uh, and sets up his judgment throne. Uh, uh, repeatedly, we find that, that phrase, that day or the day, and, and the context will indicate that that is what is in view. Okay, so in, so in light of that, then, we are to, as I guess uh, believers, gather our, or together or come together in, in community um, until Judgment Day. So, I mean, I, my Excuse question is, you, I'm sorry? Yeah, that isn't what this verse says. Oh. Um, it, what, read it carefully. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves. Incidentally, the word together is not really in that verse. Uh, it's just in not neglecting the assembling of ourselves, especially as the day draws nigh, but exhorting, and the word exhorting, 
uh, uh, could easily could also be translated comforting, and our comfort comes from Christ. There really is no statement in the Bible that now that we're in the end of the church age and in the time of the latter rain as God is bringing in the final harvest, there's nothing in the Bible that gives us uh, information about assembling together with others as we await the end of time. We, uh, we, uh, the, uh, we can do that uh, in, in an effort to, uh, to encourage one another and so on. It would not be contrary to the Word of God, but it is not commanded. There are no rules for it. It is, uh, it is something that, uh, that uh, uh, God is silent about. But, but doesn't, I, I hear what you're saying, but doesn't that, those two verses, I think the verse before that 24, assembling ourselves, isn't that a commandment that says don't forsake the assembling? Isn't that a commandment? Well, but it's forsaking the assembling with who? You know, we, uh, when we read, for example, uh, mm, when we read uh, 1 John chapter 1, we read uh, in verse... Uh, Three, that which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. This is where we assemble ourselves with. And how do we do that? Uh, by means of the Word of God, by means of prayer, by means of sharing the gospel with others, and so on. I hear what you're saying, but but can, can can this verse also include the assembling of believers together? Can it also let, include that? Let as, me as, say it again. There's nothing in the Bible that says we should not come together with other believers, but there is no command anywhere that we are to assemble with other believers. That command okay. does not exist. Now, during the church age, God did give commands for the church coming together and for uh, spiritual overseers and so on. All There's a, a many, many statements that relate to that. But these are absent as God is speaking about this time that we're now living. We, uh, This verse, uh, the very fact that God says assembling of ourselves, curious, curious, and in fact, the word assembling, which is translated here, uh, the Greek word is translated assembling together, is actually uh, 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 found only one other place, and that is in uh, in uh, Second Thessalonians. No, yes, Second Thessalonians, chapter two where we read, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together unto him. The word gathering together is the same Greek word that we find in, uh, in, uh, Matthew, in uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. Now, when we gather together unto him, are we in a group? Is God Christ going to take us as a group of people? Here's a group that are gathered together. They're going to be caught up to be with Christ. Here's another. And the answer is no. When Christ comes, we go to be with him one by one. Remember we read, there will be two in the field. One will be taken. The other will be left. There will be two in the bed. One will be taken. And the other will be left. In other words, salvation is a one-by-one one proposition. And here God is speaking about us being gathered uh, in preparation for his coming so it's one by one it's not the idea it's not that we're gathering as a body of people i see thank you very much for the camera. thank you for calling and sharing and shall we take our next call please good evening welcome to open forum good evening brother camping yes um would you please tell me the name of your new book time has an end and it has an end. Yes. And I would like to make a comment. Uh, in listening to the um, biblical time of history, I just was really appreciating that family radio, to me, is as real as the cloud and the 
fire at night. It's coming through that clearly for this time. Well, we are, you know, uh, I, I sometimes uh, am amazed that God allows us to be on the air with the kind of t preaching, teaching that we do teach, and that God is opening door after door for us to reach out into the world and in so many different languages and so on. And I can tell you very candidly, it's not because any of us are that smart or that we are that clever or are that wise. It's simply, I believe this with all my heart, that this is God's ministry. And as long as we walk humbly and are available and and uh, are ready to uh, to uh, take on any opportunity that might show, come along that seems wise to take on, uh, God uh, make and and of course uh, it it must be understood we must remain faithful because if we're not in the day that we're not faithful to the Word of God, I feel fully uh, uh, certain that will be through, that God will be finished with us. He won't use family radio any longer. Amen. And thank you very much. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our last call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, how are you doing tonight? Very well, thank you. Um, could you take a look at uh, Isaiah chapter 9, verses 14 and 15, please, and 16 also. Uh, uh, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 14. Therefore, 15. And 15. And 16. Yes, I'll read all three. Therefore the Lord will cut off from Israel head and tail, branch and rush in one day. The ancient and honorable, he is the head, and the prophet that teacheth lies, he is the tail. For the leaders of this people cause them to err, and they that are led of them are destroyed. Isn't that uh, speaking about the end of the church age and what is going on in the churches today? I believe so. I believe it, uh, it is. Thank you very much. There are many, many passages similar to this, and invariably when we examine them, or very most frequently, I wouldn't say always, but in most frequently, we, when we examine the context in which they're find, that they are found, we find that it is addressing the, our day today, the end of the church age. But shall we take our last call now? Good evening. Oh my, we won't have time. Yes. We, we're not going to have time for a final call, I'm sorry. Uh, we, uh, we have to uh, prepare for the next program. But uh, thank you again for allowing me to come into your home. And isn't it again something we can thank God for? that we can have this kind of a time just to talk together about the Word of God and, and uh, search out what is God teaching us there. We know that anything we learn from the Bible is very important. Until our next open forum, may the Lord richly bless you. Good night.